relationship with our community through our church. I think it's important that we look at it. Uh, but I want to go to the Lord in prayer and just invite the Holy Spirit to come in and take over. Uh, just to let you know, we will be starting the services at 10.30. I usually go a little bit later than that. But we just have so much to do in our services between the singing and the worship and everything. So we will be starting at 10.30. So if you can be here at that time, you won't miss anything. Um, Heavenly Father, as we humbly and reverently approach the throne of grace, we thank you for all your many blessings. You're such a good, good God. God, we love you and honor you. Father, we desire knowledge of you so that we can use wisdom to practically apply it to our lives. Father, we see the effects of what's happened in the world with the husband not taking the role as spiritual leader and pastor of the home. Father, I just pray that the teacher come, that the preacher come, that this word, God, quicken everyone in here to step up and be the spiritual leaders of their home. For the wife, Father, to come alongside the husband and be the warrior that she is called to be. To stand in the way of darkness. And for the man to step up and not cower down under the pressures and the ideas of this world. That, they, that every man would be a, as bold as a lion. Roaring at darkness that would come against his family. Father, I thank you for the Elijah anointing. I thank you for the John the Baptist anointing to break, God, our opinions and our thoughts of how this world should be. I thank you for it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 I always like starting the sermons off with questions. I want to ask you to think about what are you raising your sons to be? From a husband, from a father, and from a mother's perspective, what are you raising your husband? What are you raising your sons to be? What will your daughter's opinion of a real man? What is it? When your daughter gets grown, what is her opinion going to be on what a real man is? What kind of man will she settle for? How many people know good women that have got hooked up with the wrong man and got really wrong really quick? The biggest question I want to ask every man in here that's a husband and a father, for those that are aspiring to be a husband and a father, and I'm going to ask me this question. Am I fulfilling my position as pastor to my home? Am I fulfilling my position as pastor to my home. Several years ago, I had a, a dream, a vision. It's been so long, I can't really remember. But it was Judgment Day, and you'll, some of y'all have heard this, but I want you to, I want you to just really sink in to every father and every mother in this place. And on Judgment Day, my family was in front of me. Rachel, being the youngest, was in the first of the line. She stood before the throne of God and God looked at her and He said the worst possible thing anyone could ever hear. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. They grabbed my baby girl. The angels did. She's kicking and screaming and she's being drugged into a hell that was created for the devil and her angels. My entire family stood before God in front of me and were dragged to hell. As they were being ushered to a devil's hell, they started asking why. Why, Daddy? Why was church not the most important part of our lives? Why did you not pray with me at the end of the day? Why did you not warn me about getting involved with that person that did not put God first in their lives? That will bring the reality of your children understanding God through your relationship with God yes. to a very frightening point. Why was football, why was baseball, 
Why was soccer, why was my natural education more important than my spiritual well-being? Why, Daddy, why? You know, I had that vision a long time ago and I've still failed as the pastor to my home. Sometimes it's so easy to get caught up in the rigmarole of a day that we get distracted and we don't spend time helping our family grow in Christ. It's not hard. I'm not condemning you. I'm condemning me. I don't know your life. I don't know anything about how you act at home. All I know is how I act at home. And I know that I have failed to be the man that God called me to be. The pastor that God intended me to be to my wife and children. And that should be obvious since we're now working on my third wife. There is nothing more innocent than a newborn baby. Anybody ever looked at a newborn baby and realized that that baby could turn out to be Jeffrey Dahmer? Anybody ever looked at it and said, man, that, that baby looks completely evil. There's something not nobody looks at a baby like that because they're innocent. And for the most part, that innocent follows them all the way to a certain point in their life. However, there's an age where the innocent fades. The innocence just slowly fades away and the wickedness of the Adamic curse is realized in every person because Jeremiah 17 and 9 says the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So that baby that starts off innocent, that everything looks all right, there's coming a time of reckoning when it's going to have to decide. Each person has to decide whether they're going to submit to God or resist God. And at the end of the day, it is our responsibility as the husbands and the fathers of the home to make sure that our children follow the ways of God. The only hope that any of us have in navigating this life and in eternity is through Christ. Without a strong family structure and a loving church, there is no hope for any child. Let me say that again. Without a strong family structure, and without a strong, loving church. See, Josh has to be a, a father to a lot of young men and young women in his class. And there's times they got daddies and mamas in their life and they're good mamas and daddies. But let me tell you what teenagers don't do. They very seldom take their parents' advice. Yeah. You, you can tell them till you're blue in the face, but all of a sudden, Josh comes along and repeats the same thing, and it resonates with them. So without the youth pastor, without the youth leader, without the mentors in the local church, without somebody stepping up and say, hey, I will be a father to the orphans. I will be a daddy, a mentor, a big brother to the carnage left behind by addiction. There is no hope for any child. For the last few weeks we talked about the woman's inherent desire to dominate the man too parts of a woman's curse. The childbirth and then also inside of a woman is a desire, an innate, an inherent desire to dominate and control a man. But it's flipped because she's the weaker vessel. The man will rule over the woman. There's no way to get around it. Feminism is a lie. It is a lie. What's happened to our families today? Somebody told somebody that we needed this much of a house. Somebody lied to the women of this world telling them that in order to 
to survive. There's got to be two incomes in the home. There does not have to be two incomes in the home. There needs to be somebody staying at home with the kids, raising and loving them. You should not start a family until the woman has decided that she is going to be the homemaker, that she's going to serve her family first and foremost. Amen. That should be every woman's strongest desire. Does it always work? No. We don't live in a perfect world in perfect circumstances. How many people have looked back on their life, looked at where their kids are at now, and realized that you did some things wrong? Amen. The only way for the woman to overcome her curse is for her husband to totally and completely submit to God. The husband's most prominent responsibility is a pastor of the home. There's two sides of the shepherd's staff. There's one, there's a hook that guides, and there's a staff that protects. It is our job to guide our family. It is our job to protect our family from the line. Understanding that each person has a group of demons or familiar spirits that have been assigned to their family for generations is vital for you to understand how to raise your children. These demons are constantly peering, devising, laying in wait, looking for an opportunity to destroy the families. For generations, darkness has executed its plan to destroy the family by redefining family roles. Through the idea, listen, of the American lie. Got to have this, got to have that, got to gotta live this way. I got to gotta do this, got to do that. By the careful introduction of compromise and by making man's emphasis on the temporary things of the world. It is a man's responsibility with his wife's help to constantly be aware of the enemy in his scheme. Let me break it down for you. Your papa had a demon. Your great granddaddy had a demon. Your great great granddaddy had a demon. These are familiar spirits that know your family that's been following you around for generations. They know your individual issues, your innate issues. They follow your family from generation to generation and they know how to entice and to drag you into sin. Why is it that the children of alcoholics are much more likely to be alcoholics. It's because there's something inside of them. The devil recognizes that thing inside of them and lays a trap for their deception. Let's talk about August 6, 1945. The U.S. dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. It killed approximately 80,000 people within seconds. Destroyed every building within a one mile circumference. Fire, fires continued burning for days and destroyed everything within a four mile circumference. The radiation from that bomb has been linked to birth defects and various types of cancers for generations. 1945, 70 years ago, it happened, but people are still suffering the consequences of it today. Why? Because of the after effects of the bomb. You say, Ron, what has that got to do with family? The atom is the smallest unit that we can comprehend. In our communities, in our homes, the smallest unit that we can comprehend is the family. A church is only as strong as the families that are in the church. A community is only as strong as the families in the community. A nation is only as strong as the families that are in the nation. We see that when the family gets compromised, when the enemy destroys the idea of the family what happens there is a meltdown of society let's talk about what happens when a man is not fulfilling his kingdom role in society the absence of kingdom man is bringing destruction pain and anguish throughout the land 70 percent of all prisoners grew up fatherless 80% of all rapists grow up without a father. 71% of all high school dropouts 
grew up without a father or had an abusive father in their home. 63% of all teen suicides did not have a father in the home. 40% of all children born today, 4 out of 10, are born to single parents. 72% of adolescent murderers grew up without fathers. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. You everybody understand the, the atom bomb principle now? You see how the atom got split and what had happened? Look what happens when the family gets split. 85% of all children that exhibit behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. 90% of all addicts grew up without a true Christian father in the home. $52 billion a year are spent on prisons. That's one out of every $15 in the United States because daddy's tapped out. 85% of youths in prison grew up in fatherless homes. One in every three children grow up in a home without their biological fathers. Most all social issues are attributed to fathers not being in their children's life. A kingdom man is a man that comes under the comprehensive rule of God. And we should all aspire to be kingdom men. You want some good sermons? Look up Tony's Evan's sermons on being a kingdom man. Buy some of his books on being a kingdom man. Let's get everything. I'll tell you, if you'll get everything straight at home, your entire life will run a lot easier. So let's go to the first scripture, Genesis 1 and 26. I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. Then Jesus, then God said, Let us, which is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, make man in our image and according to our likeness. Not physical, but spiritual personality and moral likeness. And let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth, and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. In the King James Version, they call that dominion. That means to rule, to have dominion. That means to dominate or to tread down. That's what we're called to do. We are called to dominate Amen. and to tread down. There's nothing wrong with aspiring to be a great man. We should all aspire to be a great man. But a great man doesn't have a certain kind of job. A great man understands that his first responsibility is to his wife and then his children. God's plan is for men to represent him on earth. We really got to focus on that. God's plan is for us to represent God in heaven here on this earth. Man who represents God's perspective in this life and the life to come. A man is created for God so his glory can be evident through our family. See, God created the earth for us. God created man for him. He created man and woman so that God could have a family. But this earth was given to us. That's the reason that God has to have permission to interfere in your life. See, God's not going to force himself on you. Now, God does. He is sovereign. He lets the demons go when your sin gets too far. But He's always there to pull them back, to give you another opportunity to repent before they fully take you out. Amen. Satan and his angels were kicked out of the third heaven to earth. Isaiah 14 and 12, How you have fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to earth. You have destroyed the nations of the world. So we see that there's three realms of heaven. There's the third heaven. We see an example of that when the sons of God or the angels went to God before the throne in Job 1 and 6. And it said the devil went with them. 
So he went up there and he put his petition before God. God said, have you considered my servant Job? Now we can get into a theological debate about why God released Job. But let me give you two scriptures. Job 1 and 6, it said that Job said that it may be, not that they had, it may be that my sons and daughters have cursed God in their heart. Then he added a little phrase at the end of it. It said, thus did Job continue. Job 3.25 said, Job said, the thing that I feared most has come upon me. Job had a fear about his children. We don't know if it was right or wrong, but he kept pronouncing that fear out of his mouth until God had to abide by his own rules because God is a just God and he released the devil on Job's life. Now don't get it mixed up. Job lived a long time. This entire, everything that Job went through only represents about nine months of his life. On the other side of the test, on the other side of the trial, look how Job come out. I didn't like going to prison, but prison was the best thing for me. I went in one way, I come out another way. When you're going through something, don't whine, don't cry, don't beg for God to get you out of it. Just suck it up and say, God, I'm going to serve you no matter what. Yeah. And watch yeah. what God does in your life. Yeah. And if we will read, that's basically what all of Job is. He said, though you slay me, I will trust you. His friends accusing him. Friends telling him that, hey, there's got to be some sin in your life to cause this. And Job said, listen, I didn't do it. Job defended himself. And at the end of Job, we see one of the most amazing Scriptures in the Bible. It said that Job began to pray for his friends. And when he prayed for his friends, not, not this kind of prayer that I pray sometimes, God bust them in their head. Not that kind of prayer. Not a vengeful prayer. Job prayed for mercy on his friends. And when that happened, God restored everything and more that the enemy has stolen. In what ways are we made in God's images? God obviously did not create us exactly like Him because God has no physical body. He did when His seed was taken to Mary, but He has no physical body now. He's been resurrected. Instead, we are the reflection of God's glory. Some feel that our Reason, creativity, speech, and self-determination are images of God. Everybody's created a little different. And God will take the best thing about you. The devil will take your best attributes and use them against you. I'm a passionate, determined, hard-headed individual. I make up my mind we're going to do something, we're going to do it. If I go into the gym to work out with somebody, I promise you my mindset is I would rather die than tap out. I, I don't know. That's a problem, right? Well, it's good if I use it in the right direction. But if I allow the natural things to overtake me, then it is bad. Amen. See, I'm determined to turn the Short Creek community upside down for Jesus Christ. That's a good thing. I'm determined to keep some 13 and 14 year old kids from shooting dope until they're dead. I'm determined to save somebody in this community from the chaos and the destruction that is seeking them out. Amen. But there was a time I was determined to be a millionaire. There was a time I was determined I didn't care if I worked 80, 90 hours. I didn't care. I didn't care how many hours I worked. I would take a little more speed and go back at it. It didn't matter because my determination was slanted toward the natural thing. See, a lot of times that's how we get it mixed up. We got entire gospels and theology that are pressed toward the natural instead of the spiritual. Determined that I gotta have this, I gotta be here, I gotta be that. I'm worried about how other people see you. It's time for us to stop being concerned about how people view us and understand the only one that matters is God and how He views us. Amen. In Genesis chapter 2, we see a very familiar praise, phrase that we all should 
take note of. Watch this, this is interesting. We see the phrase, Lord God. But when we get into chapter 3, where the devil's talking about God, he just says God. So in chapter 2, when it's talking about the creation and everything that Magnificent had, and God being the God Jehovah, it was Lord God. But see, when the devil started talking about God, he left the Lord out. There is... Why, why did the... Look, oh, let's go to Luke 6.46. So, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I see? Let me tell you something. Satan doesn't care if you acknowledge God. He, he doesn't care. He doesn't care if you come to church on Sunday. He doesn't care if you pay your tithes or don't pay your tithes. He doesn't care if you support different ministries. The only thing the devil cares about is you making God your Lord. Amen. See, so he didn't care for Adam and Eve acknowledging God. He just wanted them to work outside the will of God. He did not. He wanted them to submit to the idea of knowledge instead of submitting to God. Why did the devil... Now, Adam and Eve, we already talked about this. They were standing right together, right? Yeah. It, 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 Adam, Adam went way over here picking plums and two acres away, Eve was over here and the devil snuck up. Yeah. Adam and Eve were right together when the devil calm and tempted Eve. And Adam stood back and watched. Why did the devil go to Eve and not straight to Adam? And yes, she's the weaker vessel, but what he did and what he's doing today is he is trying to switch the roles of the family. So he wanted Eve to work outside of God's ordained order. So he went to Eve first. And Eve, what did she say? She jumped in. What should have happened? Adam should have took his staff and he should have turned it around and he should have been again to warp on that old serpent's head. But he allowed Eve to have that conversation. And Eve took the role of leader in their home. And when he did, all hell broke loose. And today, I got to work hard by the sweat of my brow. When I plant something in the ground, I got to have a weed killer. Because he has disrupted everything by flipping the roles in the family. Genesis 3, 17 through 19 at the NLT. And to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. There's a couple times at the end of the day I'll see Patrick or Danny and I know that's a very physical job. And you can see that how hard they've worked all day long. And I'm not discounting what anybody else does. I'm not saying that, but you can see that they, in order to provide for their family, they've got to do some stuff that's uncomfortable for them. And that's the curse that's placed on man. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. You know, there's always a big debate about cremation. You're going to end up as dust anyway. God's not limited on restoring your particles no matter where they're at. The last few funerals I've been at, the ones that were cremated, I like those a lot better. I don't want people looking over my dead bodies. So. Marilyn and I have already made up our mind there. Verse 317 says, Because you heeded this reason given to the curse of the ground of human death is a man turned back on the voice of God to follow his wife in eating what that which God ordered him to abstain from. The woman sinned because she acted independently of the husband. 
disdaining his leadership, his counsel, and his protection. The man sinned because he abandoned his leadership and followed the wishes of his wife. In both cases, God's intended roles were reversed. You say, Ron, well, I, I'm trying to raise kids by myself. You better learn how to be a husband and a wife. You better learn how to be a mother and a father. I thank God that Marilyn come into our life when she did so she could be a mother to my children. I did the best I could, but there's things that she can do that I never could do for my children. There's things that a woman can do for her children. There's a, things that a man can do for his children that a woman can never do for hers. It takes a family working together in the order of God in order for God to get the glory from our family and to stand against the enemy as he rushes in. Now, some people say well, we're redeemed from the curse. I just want to clear this up right now. Let's go to Galatians 3.13. But Christ had rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When He was hung on the cross, He took for Himself the curse of our wrongdoing. For it is written in Scripture, Cursed is everyone who hung on the tree. You are redeemed from the spiritual aspect of the curse. And the natural aspect of the curse, you still suffer. Let me tell you, I've been alive for 53 years. I've seen the curse of death come for way too many people, especially in the last years. No matter how much faith I got, I'm still going to get sick sometimes. No matter how much faith I got, the money is going to run out before the month. No matter how much I pay my tithes, there's still going to be issues that I have to deal with this side of glory. The curse of the law was just plainly showing you that it is impossible for you to follow the righteousness of God. The spiritual curse was overcome by the shedding of His blood and then His blood washing our sins while as snow. One more hard statement the Lord said to me a long time ago. Our children's opinion of God, how they view Him, is based on their relationship with their earthly fathers. So you got a, a son, a daughter that's being raised without a dad in the home. How does that work? What's their opinion of God? You better have them in church somewhere so they can get the right opinion because the world's giving them their opinion. You know, one of the things I did when I was in prison, I wanted to know. I, I, I wasn't going to go in the TV room. I didn't care for the politics. I went in there every now and then. But, I, you know, you had the, the, the Hispanic uh, from across the border on this side. You had the Mexicans from uh, Texas and California on this side. You had the white boys over here. And you had to get segregated. I didn't like that. I wasn't raised like that. I, I didn't like it. But as I'm in federal prison talking to a many of gang leaders, some that had spent 20, 25 years in prison, I wanted to know all about their life. I just wanted to. And they began to tell me about how they recruited young men and what they did to recruit young men. Why is a young man likely to end up in a gang? Because he's looking for a family. We as the body of Christ are called to be the family yeah. to the lost and dying children in our community. Yeah. Here's a question that every man should be asking himself this morning. What kind of man am I? We answer that by how many women we slept with. I had a young man come to me. His father passed away when he wasn't quite one years old. His father had a reputation before he died and was shot in a drug deal gone bad. Had a reputation for being with a lot of different women. See, the young man didn't realize that his father was brutally molested when he was a boy and got a mixed idea about sexual intimacy. So he was a good looking young man and he grew up having sex with a bunch of different women. And his son, that lost his father, admired his dad that had went on to be with the Lord, I hope, 
Because I don't really know. He admired him based on how many women he slept with. That's the world's idea of a man, is that not? What kind of work do you do? You know, I got to have a, a manly job. I got to do this. I got to do that. How many fights have you been in? That's the world's idea of a man. You know what a real man is? A real man is what my dad did immediately after getting saved. Vice President of the Iron and Steel Workers Union, known as a brawler. He had an encounter with God. They placed a bet on that dock. A man walked up, one of his friends, and slapped my daddy right across the face. My dad said, why did you do that? My, the man had told daddy, he said, because we wanted to know if you were really saved. See, that's a real man. A man willing to walk in humility. Let me tell you, in order to walk in humility, you've got to be willing to accept humiliation. You've got to be willing to shut your mouth and turn around and walk the other way. Instead of trying to bow up and argue with everybody and fight everybody. That's a real man. Let me tell you, I got some work to do. Amen. How much do you bench? How much do you squat? How much money do you make? What's your education? How pretty is your wife or girlfriend? A pretty, a funny story. I used to hire a lot of salespeople. People. In the interview, what I ask them, I say, I need to see a picture of your wife or your girlfriend. Of course, I was in control and I said it in a way where they didn't question me because I, I, was, in, I was asking the questions. I was in control. And they'd pull out their wallet and I'd be looking at it and I'd pause for a second. I'd be studying the picture carefully. I said, what are you doing? I said, I just want to see what kind of salesperson you are. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of a real man is what kind of vehicle, what kind of material things do you have? That's the idea of the world's idea. Well, there's five kinds of man that I broke them down in. The first is the whiner. This is a man who gets up most morning and chooses to be paralyzed by his past. He finds it difficult to move forward in life because he's constantly looking backwards. He chooses to blame his present struggles on his past problems. The result is what becomes what I call a why, baby. Why did that happen to me? Why didn't that happen to me? Why him? Why did he get the promotion? Why did she choose him over me? Why, 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 why? We don't want to be a why, baby. Because Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it yet, but I focus on the one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press. You know what pressing requires? It requires an effort. It requires determination. i got to press. i got to pull up and do it anyway, regardless of what the world thinks. i got to suck it up, put my head down, mule up and follow. Oh God, regardless of what the world says. Why? Because one day you're going to be on judgment day and your family's going to be in front of you. And they might hear the scariest thing they could hear. We need to understand that our job as men is the most vital position in the world. The world's a mess today because men have become sissies. Because men have tapped out. Because men have been move backwards because men have taken the back seat. It is time for us to accept our call from God and follow after Him. Amen. And I promise you your families will follow. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling. The next one's the worrier. This is a man who's not paralyzed by his past but fearful of the future. Because he's constantly looking ahead. He's afraid to move forward. But unlike the whiner, the warrior doesn't ask why. Because he's too busy asking what if. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this doesn't happen? What if? What if? What if? Let me tell you something. You can be wrong. I want you to understand how cool God is. You can think you hear from God doing the wrong thing, but doing the right heart, and God's still going to honor you anyway. Amen. Amen. We got to press. Amen. We got to press. The thing 
God doesn't need people doing is nothing. Amen. Amen. Number three is the waiter. This is a man who's indecisive in, his, in the present. He isn't satisfied where he is. And he wants things to change, but he's not willing to make any changes. He's waiting for a miracle or act of God to change his circumstances or situation. See, he forgot to read in James where it said, faith without works is dead. Real faith is going to cause you to do something. He expects to be rescued and to reap the rewards with little or no effort on his own part. For instance, he wants his marriage to improve, but he's not willing to go to counseling. He wants to stop watching pornography. I read a stat the other day that 50% of pastors are addicted to pornography. I'm not sure how many pastors they got to confess to that. I would be on the other side of the 50%. I'll shut my Instagram down every now and then because I find myself just glancing at things too long. I don't want to get caught back up in that bondage. He wants to stop it, but he won't join a support group. He wants a better relationship with his children, but he won't spend more time with them. James 1, 6 and 8 says, but, we, but he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven, tossed by the wind. For the man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being, double, being a double-minded man and being unstable in all of his ways. Elijah stood upon the mountain with the prophets of Baal in front of him. He looked at them. He said, listen, if God is going to be your Lord, remember? See, the devil doesn't care for you acknowledging God. He doesn't care if you're religious. He just doesn't want God to be your Lord. Elijah said, if God is your Lord, serve Him. But he said, if Baal is your Lord, serve Him. How long are you going to halt or hesitate between two opinions? See, right here in the middle of the lukewarm state is exactly where God wants every one of us. He wants us stuck. But we got to make up our mind to move forward regardless of how deep the mud is. Of how deep the snow is. Regardless of how tired our legs get. we got to pick one foot up and put it in front of the other. The fourth kind of man is the wounded. This is a man who lives in isolation, solitude, and suffers in silence. He's still hurting from his past. He feels helpless in the moment and feels hopeless about the future. He's stuck in shame and guilt. And it's difficult for him to talk about it because he finds it very difficult to trust anyone. Jenny said she had a problem at her old church. She went to her pastor. The, she confessed to her pastor. Her pastor said, well, you don't need to be talking about this to anybody else in the church. We never want to have a church like that. We want a church where men can confess to men and women can confess to women. Where we can talk in confidence about our problems yeah. because confess your faults one to another so you may be healed. James 5.16 Romans 8 and 1 says there is there there is therefore no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. God can heal those wounds who walk after, walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The fifth man is the one that we should all want to be. He's the warrior. This is a man who doesn't whine about his past. He doesn't worry about the future. He is not waiting to be rescued from his present situation. He is not afraid of being wounded again because he is more concerned about leaving a legacy. You know what I am? I am my grandfather's legacy. I just realized that I'm my dad's legacy. But everything that my dad taught me is, is put to use now in being a legacy to honor the life that he lived. And we should all aspire to leave a legacy in our children. He is willing to fight for his marriage, his family, his children, and his brothers. He is concerned more about his character than his circumstances, his destiny than the detours in life. And his legacy is more than his losses. He's a fighter. And he would rather die with a spear in his chest than one in his back. He is a fighter. 
He would rather die with a spear in his chest looking at the enemy than turning his back around and cowering before the pressures that this world pushes on us. His motto is simple. No retreat, no surrender. He realizes that the world's opinion of man is completely opposite of what a true kingdom man is. He submits all that he has and all that he is to God. His wife, his family, his money, his career, his time, everything that he has belongs to God because God is his Lord. Like Abraham, he's willing to give his most valuable relationships to the Lord. The most precious thing Abraham could have got was that son Isaac. And Abraham took him up on that mountain. He pulled the knife out. He tied his son up. He pulled that knife out. And he was ready to sacrifice his son. Why? Because God needed to know that he was worthy to make this world, to make a great nation that would follow after him. Lord isn't a word that escapes a warrior or a kingdom man. He understands that his family cannot realize the realize fully the saving power, prayer of power of Christ without total submission. <clears throat> For you fellows that don't have any children, you may be tempted to think that this scripture doesn't apply to you or this message. This is a lie. Our community is full of fatherless children. Yes. And it's the job of the men here at Short Creek to step in and lead these children to Christ. Yes. It's our job to be the kingdom fathers of the fatherless in this community. Let me get the worship team to come up. everyone stand with me and bow your heads. <clears throat> Before I get in the altar and repent, because I don't know about y'all, this is rough on me. Um, I just want to ask, does anyone want to make God the Lord of their life? Anybody brave enough to say, I'm tired. I want to make God the Lord of my life. Not, not Savior, but Lord. See, He can't be your Savior until He becomes your Lord. See, that's not preached in a lot of churches today. Submission is something that we're taught that is horrible. Most UFC fights end in submission. And we win by submitting. Think about that. As they play this song, <clears throat> if you need prayer, and I'm fixing to get here, my wife's going to pray for me, that I can be a better pastor of my home. And be a better pastor here. And I encourage every man that feels like that maybe they've slipped or failed, or slacked off, hadn't really done the job, I encourage you to join me in the altar. I just, uh, my heart's heavy. It's heavy for the lost in this community. It's heavy for the way that I've watched the an enemy attack the families of this church. It's heavy. But I promise you, if we'll repent, give God permission to interfere with our life, He'll straighten things out. No go ahead. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Yeah.